Your prophet married a 60 year old. How do you follow a 50 year old man who married a young girl? Islam is definitely from Satan because it promotes pedo behavior. Muslims are all brainwashed by a deviant man who only cared about his own desires. The age of Aisha is enough for any sane person in the 21st century to stay away from Islam. I would rather believe in a three-in-one God or even believe in aliens, but I will never follow a man who married a six-year-old. Hadith books clearly say that she was playing with dolls in her husband's house, imagine. If you insist on being a Muslim, at least you should reject the Hadith completely. These are just a few examples of the millions of harassment incidents Muslims face daily. I get calls all the time from young Muslims who are being harassed in school. They are asking for help because they are bullied literally every day. And the easiest topic for a bully to use is this. And also for a preacher or for an Islamophobe. They focus on this issue because they know that the refutation for this specific issue takes time. In order for someone to clear his doubt from the age of Aisha issue, he has to watch at least a one or two hours video. And most of us right now, we want short answers. Just, you know, tell me in a minute, tell me in two minutes. And whenever I send a one or two hours video to someone, he's like, nah, I'm not going to waste my valuable time learning for two hours. For that specific reason, Islamophobes just focus on this all the time. And they bet that you will be lazy to learn the response. What I did is I searched YouTube for a refutation for the Islamophobic claim about the age of Aisha. I found a lot of 5 minute, 10 minute videos. I watched a lot of them. By the way, that took like 3 or 4 hours. So if you think about it, I actually wasted more time than watching one big video. But anyway. What I found out is all of these YouTubers, they know that the audience have a very short attention span. And if they extend on talking and talking and talking about the subject, no one will ever listen to them. So what they do is they try to make a short answer, but unfortunately, it has nothing in it. I learned nothing. All of this 5 minute, 10 minute videos, even 15 minute videos, it didn't convince me, it didn't give me something solid so I can stand on it and have zero doubt. So what I decided is, you know what, I will go in depth and disassemble this claim all together once and for all. If you really want to remove this age of Aisha issue from your life, you have to stay with me until the end. Don't skip in the middle. Every chapter in this video is only disassembling part of the claim. So if you watch only one or two chapters and was lazy to watch the other, please don't come back to me and tell me that my answer was not convincing enough. If you think your time is more valuable than listening to this refutation fully, so please either don't have doubt to begin with or find another way to clarify your doubt. Get ready, bring your coffee, and let's start. During the last 50 to 100 years, lawmakers in some countries started to decide to prevent people from getting married before the age of 18. Gradually and slowly, most of the countries in the world started adopting that decision. They also decided that anyone who breaks this specific rule is to be considered a criminal and to be put in jail. And anyone who questions their decision or ask for a reason, or disagree, is considered immoral. Basically, you have to agree with them, or else. There is only one problem with this new rule that they made up. The problem is called history books. To convince the whole world that marrying before 18 is a crime, you have to burn all the history books. This is the only way this new bubble you created for us will survive. This is the only way we will believe that everyone under 18 is a kid. This is Richard II of England. He got married to his wife Isabella when he was 29 and she was 6 years old. Do you think he was a pedo? This is Stephen I or King Saint Stephen. He got married to Gisela of Hungary 
when she was 11. Do you also think he was a pedo? This is Isaac II. He married his wife Margaret of Hungary when she was 10 years old. What do you think of him? This is Alexios II. At the age of 11, he was married to Agnes of France. Her age was 10 years old. She was the daughter of King Louis of France. What do you think of him? Tancred, the Prince of Galilee, married his wife Cecile of France when she was 8 years old. What's wrong with all of these people? Philip II of France got married to Queen Isabella when he was 14 and she was 10 years old. Not only that, but even before they got married, she had previously been betrothed to Henry II when he was 5 and she was 1. This is Ladislaus IV. He got married to his wife, Elizabeth of Sicily, Queen of Hungary. Their ages was 7 and 8. David II of Scotland. He got married to his wife, Joanne, the daughter of King Edward II of England, when he was 7 and she was 4 years old. Can you imagine how fun was that marriage? Peter IV of Aragon. He got married to his wife, Queen Maria, when he was 18 and she was 8 years old. King Henry IV of England got married to his wife Mary when he was 13 and she was 10 years old. King Louis XI of France, he got married to his wife Charlotte when he was 27 and she was 9 years old. Prince William II got married to his wife Princess Mary when he was 15 and she was 9 years old. According to this book, Groose was four years old when she got married. Then her husband died. Then she got married to another person when she was six years old. It was common for girls to be engaged at the age of three. If a girl, unfortunately, was not engaged by the age of 15, she would bring shame to her family. We don't know a better love story than the one between Victor Colina and Marquise Pascara. She got engaged to him when she was four years old. Are you bored yet? Because I am already. These are just some examples from Europe. Some examples from the thousands of examples that you will find when you do your own research. Now let's have a look outside Europe. This is Genghis Khan, the founder of the Mongol Empire. His real name is Temujin. It says here when Temujin was nine years old, his father went in search for a wife for him. Why did he want his son to get married when he was nine years old? Isn't that weird? Isabella of Jerusalem got married when she was 10 years old, and she was betrothed when she was eight years old. Amr ibn al-As was already a father when he was 11 years old. That means that he got married either at the age of 10 or at the age of nine. This is Tut an Khamun. He became the king of Egypt when he was nine years old, ruled over Egypt from the age of nine to the age of 18. Then he died. Do you think he was a kid? Muhammad ibn al-Qasim al-Thaqafi, the leader of the Muslim army in the battles against the armies of Asind. He was 17 years old when he became the army leader. Do you think he was a kid? Osama ibn Zayd kept climbing up the ranks until he became the leader of the Muslim army when he was 17 years old. That is the equivalent of what a 50 years old man today achieves throughout his life. If we look at the United States, in 1880, the ages of consent were set between 10 and 12 at most states. With the exception of Delaware, it was 7. This is Sir William Blackstone. He wrote this book, Commentaries on the Laws of England. This book is still taught in Oxford University until today. And it clearly shows that the age of marriage in England law was 7 years old. Lawmakers are just raising the age of consent gradually over time. According to The Guardian, in 2009, Spain raised the age of consent from 13 to 16. Texas law permits individuals who have reached the age of majority, 18, to get married without parental consent. However, those 14 and older may get married with the consent of their parents or legal guardians. 
In California, you must be 18 to get a divorce. But there is no minimum age to get married, as long as a parent or a guardian consent and the court gives permission. California is among just seven states, including New Mexico and Oklahoma, that does not have a minimum age of marriage. According to the Canadian Department of Justice, a 12 or 13 years old can consent to sexual activity if the partner is also young. Who is coming up with all of these rules? And how are they deciding those numbers? One says 12, one says 13, one says 16, one says 18, and one says no minimum. You know what? Let's ignore all that and stick to the Christian Bible as a reference for morality. Not because I believe in it, I just think it will be fun. As most of these Islamophobes talking about our beloved Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, are Christian. This is a picture of Saint Joseph, this 90 years old man who is carrying the baby God of the Christians in his hand. He was, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, 90 years old when he got married to the mother of God. Let's ignore the whole concept of a baby God for now and just focus on the age difference. He married Mary when he was 90 and she was 12 years old. Her age is also in the same Catholic encyclopedia. The priest said to Joseph, you have been chosen by a lot to take into your keeping the virgin of the Lord. But Joseph refused, saying, I have children, and I am an old man, and she is a young girl. And then the priest said to Joseph, do it for the Lord your God, you can read it fully on your own. And for those ignorant Christians who will claim that he married her, but he never touched her, they will tell you, no, they have lived like a father and daughter in the same house. Read Matthew 1.25 but he didn't consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The same verse in the New American Standard Bible says, but he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called him Jesus. That is the full consummation of the marriage after the birth of the baby God. According to 2 Chronicles 36, Jehoiakim was 8 years old, when he became king. Still think an eight years old was just a kid? According to 2 Kings 16, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 16 years. Focus on the numbers. He was king between the ages of 20 to 36, 16 years. And according to 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah, his son, began to reign when he was 25 years old. By doing a simple calculation, Ahaz, the father, died when he was 36 years old. His son took his place when he was 25 years old. So the difference in age between the father and the son is what? 11 years. You need 9 months of pregnancy and before that you need to get married and to be engaged. So Ahaz got married either when he was 9 or 10 years old maximum. How old was his wife? You also have the famous example of Rebecca being three years old when she married Isaac. Genesis 17, Sarah gave birth to Isaac at the age of 90. Genesis 22, Isaac was in his thirsties when Rebecca is born. Genesis 23, Sarah died at the age of 127 year old. That makes Isaac 37 at the time of his mother's death. Genesis 25, Isaac married Rebecca at the age of 40. According to one calculation, she might have been three years old. Some Christians disagreed and they redid the math and calculated her age to be more than three years old, but definitely less than nine. That number is after stretching out all the events to their maximum. According to the William Davinson Talmud, if a man unwillingly had was a three years old who was married to another man who was married to another man he is liable to bring us an offering whatever if he had sex with a three years old who is already married to another man if we read Genesis 11 we will understand that Abraham was two years older than Haran 
the father of Sarah. As Sarah was also called Iska because all gazed upon her beauty. And in Genesis 17, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will my son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? If we do the math, Abraham is 10 years older than Sarah. And Abraham is two years older than her father. That means that the difference in age between Sarah and her father is eight years. In other words, the father of Sarah begot Sarah when he was eight years old. So if we put nine months of pregnancy and getting married and whatever, that means that the father of Sarah got married when he was seven or less. Last but not least, let's talk about prophet David. According to Acts 2 in the New Testament, David was a prophet of God. He was a prophet that every Christian believes in. Let's see what he did. 2 Samuel 11 One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. She is Bethsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. The woman conceived and sent a word to David saying, I am pregnant. He got the wife of Uriah pregnant. And if you read until the end of 2 Samuel 11, you will see that he killed her husband Uriah to get rid of him and keep his wife for himself. What an amazing prophet. If you are shocked, I am pleased to tell you that the surprise is yet to come. Guess how old was Bethsheba, the wife of Uriah, the woman that David raped? No really guess. Pause the video and write your guess in the comments below. How old was the woman who got raped by David, the married woman? According to the Jewish Encyclopedia, Bethsheba was only eight years old and eight months of age when her son Solomon was born. Solomon? Solomon, the son of David? While some maintain that she was not older than six, so she was either eight or six, not when he raped her, no, wait, when Solomon was born. But Solomon is the second son of David and Bathsheba. That is late in the story, according to the William Davinson Talmud. And the Bechiba gave birth to Solomon when she was six because a woman is stronger and can conceive at an earlier age. Know that it is true that women conceive at an earlier age, as Bechiba has already given birth to a child from David before the birth of Solomon. So Solomon is the second son of David and Bechiba. Let's sum it up. She was six or eight when she had Solomon. You know what? Let's say it. Let's be generous. That means that she had her first son before Solomon, when she was seven, at least, right? That means that he raped her when she was six. But she was already married to Uriah when he raped her. That means that she was married to Uriah when she was five. Christians are so funny. Christians have no problem believing in a prophet of God who raped a six-year-old woman and killed her husband. But they say, no, we don't want to follow Prophet Muhammad because we think there is a question mark on his morality. Wow. Subhanallah. According to Oxford Academic, life expectancy at birth was a brief 25 years old during the Roman Empire. It reached... 33 years by the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, the average lifespan of males born in landholding families in England was 31.3 years. And the biggest danger was surviving childhood. Once children reached the age of 10, their life expectancy was 32.2. As you can see on the chart, life expectancy only started to rise lately. Imagine going to a girl in the Middle Ages who expects to die when she becomes 30. And due to the high infant mortality rates, 
to make sure she has offspring, she has to give birth five, six, seven times. Because not all of them will live, right? Maybe half of them will die. And you go to her and tell her, don't get married as soon as you hit puberty. No, you have to wait until you become 18 first. (laughs) You will live for 18 years as a single woman. And then you will have only 12 years left in your life before you die. And in this 12 years as a married woman, you have to at least give birth five or six times because most of your kids will die. She will definitely laugh at you. So the question is to the lawmakers, where did you get the number 18 from? 18 years minus one day is a kid, 18 years plus one day is an adult. Other lawmakers in other countries make up numbers like 14 or 16, right? Where are these guys coming with these numbers from? Do you have reasons or did you just come up with it randomly? And if you have reasons, do these reasons apply to every race, every environment, every society, every culture, and every time? If we assume these numbers are good for us today, and you know what, I don't disagree. Do they apply to history? where all humanity throughout history, in all the continents, all over the world, criminals and pedos according to you? By the way, this is not my refutation to the Islamophobic claim about the age of Aisha. This is just chapter one. Wait until the end and you will understand how Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was the perfect moral example for humanity. And how your bully is either a human shaitan or at best, a deluded person. A lot of you have this question in mind. What happened? How did our society change from 10 years old kings and leaders to 20 years old useless teenagers? And it is a fair question. A lot actually happened. Industrial revolution changed our life from farming and taking care of animals to factory workers, engineers, lawyers, and so on. Instead of just learning how to milk a cow and then immediately start a family, kids now have to learn math, physics, chemistry, language, geography, history, years and years of memorization and books and stuff that you have to shove in your brain and then put it on the test paper and then forget it the second day. All of that is prerequisites to be considered a person who can start a career. The feminism movements, wave after wave, completely changed the society. At first it was for the better, and then you know what happened. Women stopped being the glue that holds the family together, and the builders of the future. No need for that anymore. Just dump your kids in the kindergarten, school, college, whatever, Order some Uber Eats and watch a movie to kill the time instead of spending it with your family. Those guys in school will take care of your kids, don't worry. They will raise them to believe that their grandfather was an ape and there are 50 genders. We got this, don't worry. And if you have other needs that you don't know how to fulfill them without having a family, you can fulfill them using the internet, you know how. No need for a family anymore. Life expectancy is not 30. Life expectancy grew to 70 now. So no rush to start a family as soon as possible. You have 70 years to live, right? Infant mortality decreased. So no need for a woman to have a lot of children anymore. If she gets one or two, she is expecting them to live. A typical 15-year-old teenager became a fully grown man physically, but a little kid mentally. Never took responsibility or faced any real problem in his life. Society will not even let him take responsibility even if he asks for it. That leaves him feeling useless and promotes a lifestyle of seeking pleasure by any means. And that led society to look at teenagers as not capable of getting married because, to be fair, yeah, most of them aren't. In the middle of all of that chaos, a lot of very smart but not good businessmen So an opportunity. A huge population is deprived of family connection, deprived of social tender, deprived of their normal sexual needs, 
due to the late marriage and broken family structure. They are depressed, they are lonely, they are looking for companionship, they are looking for validation, for care. And when they lose hope in getting all of that, they lean towards seeking fleeting pleasures. And because it is fleeting, as in the world itself, fleeting pleasures, nothing will ever fulfill their human needs. Wait a minute. That is a huge market. We call it the market of loneliness. The global film industry was worth 136 billion US dollars in 2018. In 2022, the total revenue of the recorded music industry amounted to 31.2 billion US dollars. 90% of that music is about adultery or intoxicants. Porn industry generates 97 billion US dollars annually. Tinder app alone makes 1.9 billion US dollars. OnlyFans alone makes 2.5 billion US dollars. And with all of these desires for sale, real girls started to have a hard time competing with the professional supermodels or photoshopped unreal bodies. That is another market. The beauty industry generates 100 billion in revenue worldwide. It doesn't work for you? Don't worry. The global plastic surgery market size is valued at 39.5 billion US dollars. And for those who keep trying and trying to find happiness, but they end up alone anyway and depressed, don't worry. We can make more profit from you. The alcoholic beverage market is projected to grow from 2.1 trillion, trillion, not billion, trillion in 2022 to 4.1 trillion by 2029. As long as you keep depriving people from their natural need to have a connected society, a warm, happy, close family relationship, they will always be seeking happiness and they will always work hard to buy as many fleeting pleasures as they can. If they let you get married and fulfill your basic needs, they will lose all of these profits, or at least a big chunk of it. According to The Guardian, politicians are voted the world's least trusted people. The irony is, when it comes to the age of consent, you people let the least trusted people in the world teach you what is moral and what is immoral. While you know for a fact that all of these politicians are easily controlled by lobbies and by multi-billion dollar businesses. The same businesses that are profiting from your misery and your depression. I wish someday we can break that loop. Anyway, if this is how they want to live their life, I don't care. Let them do whatever they want. The problem is with young Muslims who are trying to live in that society. Two or three times a month, I get the same call. Salamu alaikum, I need help. I am 15 years old and I am suffering. I am being tortured. I have burning desires. I need to love and be loved. I have sexual desires that needs to be fulfilled. They will not allow me to get married. The only thing that is allowed is adultery. It's not only allowed, it is encouraged. If I don't commit adultery, they pick on me at school. They call me names. They bully me because I don't sin. I get temptation 24-7 all around me. Adultery became so easy and marriage became illegal. In other words, haram became halal and halal became haram. And I have to live in this daily torture for the next four to five years at least before they allow me to exercise my basic rights as a human being to get married. Why am I not free to decide my own life? They are basically forcing me to commit adultery or to be miserable every day of my life. It is like telling a boy you can't eat or drink until you reach a certain age first. I need to fulfill my basic human needs now. I can't wait anymore. They let boys my age decide their gender, but they don't let me decide to get married. 
I feel like I am being enslaved by a bunch of hypocrites pretending to care about us while torturing us. Whenever I get this type of calls, I don't really know what to respond. All I can say to him and to everyone in his situation, may Allah grant you patience. We talked a lot. I think it is time to replace all this chaos with clear definitions. First, we need to define what is an adult. For a person to be considered an adult, he or she needs to fulfill two things. Physical maturity and mental maturity. Let's talk about both of them one by one. Number one, physical maturity or puberty. Puberty is something that we have no control over. The age of puberty, as you can see, changed a lot over history. Sometimes it was as early as 5 years old, sometimes it was as late as 18 or even more. The age of puberty might be connected to the environment, nutrition, genetics or any other factors. Doesn't matter, it comes when it comes. This is Lina Medina, the youngest confirmed mother in history. In 1939, she gave birth when she was 5 years old. This is Hilda Trujillo. She gave birth when she was 8 years old. I don't think this is a good thing or a good idea. I'm just talking from the biological perspective. It is a fact that some people hit puberty earlier than others. So please stop making false claims that no one ever hit puberty before 12. That is just wrong. There is no magic number of years when all people hit their puberty worldwide all over history. It changes. So let's agree that we don't put a number of years on it. The second thing is mental maturity, and this is a tricky one, so I will try to simplify it as much as I can. Let's take an example. Focus with me on this one because it's very important. I want you to think about an average 20 years old man today. This figure represents all the time he spent in his life. Let's do some simple math to calculate his mental age. First, I will remove all the time he wasted in front of television screens. All the movies, all the TV series, talk shows, sports events, all of that. It didn't benefit him in any way or make him grow mentally further. Then I will remove all the time he wasted on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, watching things that will never benefit him in any way, shape, or form. Then I will remove all the time he wasted playing video games, either on his PC, PlayStation, Xbox, or on his phone. Then I will remove all the time he spent depressed, because he was deprived of love or companionship, looking for a girlfriend, then dumping her, then looking for another one. All of that didn't benefit him in any way. Didn't make him grow as a man. Then I will remove all the time he was drunk or partying or high with his friends or whatever. And finally, I will remove all the time he spent learning subjects in school that did not directly benefit his future career. Every subject where he spent time memorizing some stuff and then dumped that stuff on the exam paper and then forgot all of them. Now let's look at what is left. This 20 years old man has the mental age of a 5 years old boy. Now let's imagine a 10 years old man who worked as a shepherd in a Bedouin society 1000 years ago. He didn't have any TV, mobile, phone or video games. He didn't have to learn physics, math, geography, all of that. His father taught him how to take care of sheep. It took him about one year to be an expert. He started working when he was 8 years old. He got his puberty when he was 9. He got married when he was 10. He didn't waste years of his life searching for a girlfriend and dumping her and then searching for another one. That didn't happen. He became a father when he was 11 years old. Then he joined the army, climbed up the ranks, and then he became the army leader when he was 18. Then he became the tribe leader when he was 20 years old. Life was so much simpler. Both of the two examples I mentioned are 20 years old men. One of them is literally starting his life, still thinking about what to do with his career, while the other one is already a grandfather and a tribe leader. That is the end of his career. 
Adulthood is not an age. Adulthood is a status. Osama ibn Zayd was the Muslim army leader when he was 17. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was the consultant of the Prophet and the scribe of the Revelation when he was 17. Az Zubair ibn al-Awwam was a fearless warrior when he was 17. Zayd ibn Sabit learned three languages and became the official translator of the Prophet when he was 13. Attab ibn Usaid was the president of Mecca, president, when he was 18. Abdul Rahman al-Nasr was the president of Al-Andalus when he was 21. If you are a teenager, please understand, you are not a kid. You can choose to be a kid and you can choose to be an adult. Adulthood is not an age, it's a status. Don't let them push you down with words like, you're just a kid, you are still stupid. When you grow up, you can do whatever you want. All of these great men, great leaders, were exactly your age. According to this article in BBC, the English kept their children at home till the age of seven or nine at the utmost. Adulthood is not an age, adulthood is a status. Hope this part is clear now. My wife always says this, if a man-eating lion got loose in the United States of America, it would starve to death because there aren't any men to eat. I travel through the Middle East, I travel through Asia, I travel through Africa. I see 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds, 16-year-old men. And I come back here and I find 35-year-old boys. There needs to be a wake-up call. The second thing we need to clearly define is what are the rules of marriage in Islam? Marriage in Islam is done in five steps. Step number one, promise. Step number two, engagement. Step number three, consent. Step number four, contract. Step number five, consummation. If you find other words for these steps, that is simply because I am translating to English. So this is the words I found suitable for what I am trying to refer to. And you should also take care that Muslims, when they talk to each other, they refer to any of these steps with the word marriage. So they can refer to the promise as a marriage. They can refer to the consent as a marriage. They can refer to the consummation as a marriage. So if you don't understand what they're talking about, ask them to clarify for you. Anyway, for the sake of this video, I will make sure to call each step by its distinct name. Let's go through each one of them one by one. Step number one, the promise. This step has no minimum age, and it is not obligatory, and it is rarely done anyway. Let's imagine I have a righteous friend who got a son. I go to him, I congratulate him, and I tell him, you know what? I know you're a good man, and I know you will raise your son to be a righteous person. And it will be an honor for my family to join your family in marriage. So I want your son, when he grows up, to marry my daughter when she grows up. You are the only one I can trust. If he agrees, that is considered a marriage promise. Does that mean they are already married? No. Does that mean they have to get married? No. Does that mean they cannot marry someone else? No. It is just a promise that we will ask them for their opinion when they grow up. As I said, it is rarely done anyway, and it has little to no effect. Step number two, engagement. The purpose of an engagement is to give the boy and the girl an opportunity to get to know each other, discover their thoughts, their opinions, ask each other questions about their future plans and whatever. But the purpose of an engagement is not to flirt, love, enjoy each other, touch each other, or even be alone in the same room without a mahram. The only rule during this step is you cannot consider someone else while being engaged. You cannot be talking to two people at the same time and comparing them and choosing between them. No. If you want to consider someone else, you have to break the first engagement first and then be engaged to someone else. Step number three, consent. And this one is self-explanatory, but it has rules. Consent of the girl's father is not enough. You have to get the girl's approval as well as her father's approval. The girl knows if this man will make her happy or not, while her father knows if he and his family are trustworthy or not. With both consents, we make sure that we don't make an emotional decision, 
and we don't end up with uh, someone who is scamming us. The second rule is kids can't consent. Both the boy and the girl should hit puberty and should be mentally mature. At what age that happens? It happens when it happens. For example, if you have a 25 years old man who spends most of his time between playing video games or scrolling TikTok while he is depending on his parents for his livelihood. This person, according to the Sharia law, is a kid. He cannot consent on marriage. While if you have a 10 years old farmer who hit puberty and he is taking responsibility of his family farm, he is doing all the plowing and harvesting while taking care of his parents, this person, according to Sharia law, is an adult. Look at his life, not his age. Step number four, the contract. After the contract, they are considered husband and wife, but wait. They still don't live together or have a private physical relationship. At this stage, the man is expected to pay a dowry to the bride. Take care to the bride, not to her family. And according to this verse, in case of a divorce, she gives back half of this dowry. Step number five, consummation. This is what we call today a wedding. This will definitely, definitely, definitely never happen unless both of them, the man and the woman, are fully adults physically and mentally and capable of assuming responsibility and taking care of newborns. If they are not ready to do that yet, then no wedding for them. As you noticed, there are no age prescribed for all of the stages. Allah didn't prescribe an age because it is something that changes from time to time and from environment to environment. If Allah prescribed one specific age, knowing that no one number fits all, this will cause oppression to a lot who are not ready yet when they hit that age, and oppression to a lot who are ready earlier, but they have to wait for no reason. Allah gave us the general rules that will make sure that every marriage in every culture will be successful. And it is left to the medical professionals, the sociologists, the psychologists of every country to determine what is a suitable age for their community. These are the perfect guidelines that the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, followed in his marriage to Aisha. And these are the guidelines that every one of us should follow. I want to end this chapter with a couple of hadith that I felt are very important to this subject. According to this hadith, a girl came to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and told him, My father forced me to marry someone. He said, It is your choice. Agree or disagree? The marriage will not happen without your consent. According to this hadith, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Some marry a girl for her beauty, some marry a girl for her family, some marry a girl for her wealth, and some marry a girl for her righteousness. The correct choice out of all of those is you should marry a girl for her righteousness. And finally, according to this hadith, whoever fulfills the requirements of marriage, physical and mental maturity, should get married as soon as possible. It guards you from adultery and it reduces your temptation to sin. And whoever can't yet should do a lot of fasting, it helps with self-control. The final hadith is in a form of a recommendation, not an obligation though. If you decide you don't want to get married early, it's up to you. It's not a sin. You just have to find a way to control your desires. As the need for companionship, love and compassion as well as your sexual needs might overwhelm you. And keep in mind that the eye commits adultery just by looking. That means that all the doors to fulfill those desires are closed. Was Mother Aisha radiallahu anha really six years old when she wrote her marriage contract and nine years old when she consummated the marriage? Very important question. This is her own authentic narration. She said, I was six on the contract day and I was nine on the consummation day. Some brothers that I have great respect for made a calculation of her age at the time of the marriage by calculating the age of her older sister and doing some complicated math they ended up with a much higher age. Of course, with all due respect to all of these brothers, I have five comments on what they did. Number one, we already have an authentic narration from the woman herself saying she was nine 
And we also have another narration from the same woman saying, إذا بلغت الجارية تسعة سنين فهي امرأة. Girls in her community became adult women at nine years old on average. She is saying that. Number two. This effort that you put to do all of this math to prove that she was older, it just shows weakness and subjugation to the Western culture. As if they ever came close to a moral high ground in anything related to family values. According to the Gut Matcher Institute, premarital sex is nearly universal among Americans and has been for decades. In the study, 99% of respondents had had sex and 95% had done so before marriage. Why should I let those people teach me about moralities? Instead, you should raise your head high as we are the only ummah that still have some moralities in this world today. Number three. It doesn't really matter if she was nine on the consummation day or 12 or 16. As long as she fulfilled the rules, physical and mental maturity, and the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him, got her consent as well as her father's, then the marriage is halal. Number four. She was engaged to someone else before the Prophet. Isn't that enough to show that she was going to get married anyway, if not to the Prophet, then to the man that she was engaged to? Number five, the testimony of an enemy is the strongest testimony. The Prophet Muhammad is either the most beloved or the most hated to you. There is rarely anything in the middle. You can doubt the testimony of those who love him as their love towards him might affect their testimony. Okay, fair enough. But what about the testimony of the haters, the kuffar, the Islamophobes of his time? They called him crazy. They called him a magician. They called him a liar. They called him a poet. They attempted to kill him and kill all of his followers. Why didn't any one of them think about saying something about his marriage? Not a single comment. If it was a juicy topic as they try to make you believe, they would have talked about it 24-7, like the idiots of today. The point is, it wasn't anything weird, as I showed you in chapter 1 of this video. If you missed it, by the way, or scroll to here, go back to it first and watch it. And if you are watching a cut, not the full video, I will leave a link to the full video under in the description. I showed that from ancient Egypt to ancient China to ancient Europe, to ancient Africa, everywhere. This is how people got married. So there is no need to defend yourself against an ignorant person who knows nothing about history and arrogantly claims that he knows everything. Just remember this. If you measure an item and you get a wrong measurement, either the item's dimension itself is wrong or your own ruler is faulty. The second probability is never considered by an arrogant person because his arrogance blocks his eyes. I don't want to end this video until I answer all of your common questions first. I will try to answer briefly at least. I don't want to leave anyone with any doubt in his heart. So let's go through them as quickly as possible. The age difference between the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and Mother Aisha was more than 40 years. Were they happy together or was it a weird relationship? Okay, first of all, I made a video called Nada Complains to Aisha. I will leave a link to it in the description. After we finish, go watch it. It shows the amazing love story in details between the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, and Mother Aisha. I guarantee you, you will witness the best love story ever. Second of all, do you know what is the biggest sign of a love of a woman? A sign that she cannot hide or lie about. Yes, jealousy. On your free time, read these narrations carefully and see how her jealousy for the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him was unmatched. And third of all, Sharia law gives any woman the ability to get divorced from her husband. That shows that she was with him because she wanted to be with him. Otherwise, she would just get a divorce. And fourth of all, when the wives of the Prophet were complaining because they wanted more money and the Prophet was giving away most of his money to the poor and living a simple life, Allah revealed this verse in Surah Al-Ahzab. O Prophet, say to your wives, if you desire the life of this world and its luxury, 
then come and I will divorce you and I will let you go graciously. After this revelation, the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him when to Aisha started with her. He told her, I will ask you a question, but don't hasten your answer. I want you to consult your parents first before answering me. And he read the verse for her. She didn't hesitate a second. She said, will I consult my parents when it comes to you, O Prophet? Of course not. I am sure. I want Allah and his Prophet and the hereafter. They are trying to paint a picture in your head as if he was abducting her or something. Based on all of the narrations that you will learn when you watch Nada complains to Aisha, and what we've read together now, she was the happiest woman of her time. And finally, she lived 50 years after the Prophet. She could have complained once or said something. But what she did is she was writing poetry about his goodness. If you don't like marrying someone that is not the same age as you, it's up to you, don't do it. It's not an obligation nor a recommendation. But if you find a couple who are happily married with age differences between them, just let them be happy. Leave them alone. You can be happy the way you want and they can be happy the way they want. As long as it's halal, of course. Next question. How come Mother Aisha played with toys if she was an adult physically and mentally? Yeah, this weird deductions that they try to make whenever they are out of real evidence. Brother, I'm very close to being 40 years old. I teach Islamic studies, I run several businesses, I take care of my four children. And I still visit my PlayStation to play a couple of games and I enjoy it. Does that make me a child? Adults also play games, my friend, if you didn't know. Now the games are PlayStation and Xbox. Back in the 7th century... PlayStation was not invented yet, so they played with toys. And according to this hadith, the Prophet himself was also playing a racing game and he was having fun while playing. By the way, he was playing this racing game when he was almost 60 years old. So what is your problem? Next question. Even if we agree that a 10 years old shepherd was mature enough to be responsible to take care of his wife and kids, he was definitely not wise enough to choose the correct wife. And that applies to the girl too. She was not wise enough to choose the correct husband. You know what? You are absolutely correct. Over time, we gain wisdom. A 20 years old should be wiser than 10, of course. A 30 years old should be wiser than a 20 years old. And a 40 years old should be even wiser than a 30 years old. It is better for you to delay all your life decisions until you are at least 40 or 50 to make sure you are as wise as possible. Believe it or not, before the death of the family structure, there was something called a family. This imaginary family consisted of a father, a mother, kids, grandfathers, grandmothers, uncles, aunts, and their children, and their children, children. A typical family normally would consist of 200, 300 members. All of those members share together their knowledge and expertise. They also take care of each other, consult each other in every life decision. Now you are just a lonely individual who sadly has access to his own expertise. And that's it. That means that you have to reinvent the wheel in every life decision you have. You have to rediscover wisdom by making the same mistakes everyone did before you again and again and again. Even if your parents try to give you advice, you will say, oh, they are boomers. They don't know what's going on. So you will keep doing the same mistakes and this is why we say teenagers are stupid. And yes, you are correct. They are not wise enough to make the correct decision because of that reason. Because the family died. But if you are a member of a normal family, your life will be much easier. Anyway, the same way you consult a doctor before you take medicine, you also have to consult your father, your mother, your grandfather, your uncles, and so on before making a big decision like choosing a career path, for example, or getting married. Their collective expertise is much better than whatever wisdom that you may collect after 20 or 30 years of your life. And it is very important to expose the hypocrisy of those who are forbidding boys and girls from getting married under 18. They are asking them to choose university before 18, and choosing university will affect your whole life career. 
they are even asking them to choose their gender. So that will also affect their lives. Don't be fooled by their pretentious deception. Next question. Was the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him following his desires when it came to choosing Aisha as a wife? Before I answer this question, we need to understand something. The word following your desire comes with an evil connotation only when it is connected to haram behavior. For example, if I say this person does not fast Ramadan because he is following his desires, that is a bad thing, right? But if I say this person desired to eat a banana, so he followed his desire and bought a banana and ate it. There is nothing wrong with that, right? So now back to your question. Islamophobes are always trying to paint a fake picture of our beloved Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, as a lustful man who is in pursuit of virgins and money and whatever. While any beginner in Zira can easily present the exact opposite. For example, according to Health News, men's sex drive seem to peak at their 20s and begin to decrease in their 30s and onward slowly. The Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, got married to one woman from the age of 25 to the age of 50. This is all his sex drive peak years. And she was 15 years older than him. Is that a lustful man to you? Is that a man in pursuit of virgins and money? Do you know who was his second wife after Khadija radiallahu anha died? Sauda bint Zama. She was... 66 years old when he married her. Is that a lustful man to you? Is that a man looking for virgins and money? Please, if you want to learn about the Prophet of Allah, learn about him from Muslim books. Do not learn about him from the fake tales of the Islamophobes. Next question. If you have a nine years old daughter, would you give her away in marriage? There is no if. I already have a daughter and the rules apply to her like it applies to anyone else. When she hits puberty and she is mentally mature and she comes to me and tell me, I am a grown up now, I am responsible and uh, I hate puberty and I have desires and I need to fulfill these desires and I need to get married. Why would I say no to that? Okay, when will that happen exactly? At which age? I don't know. When it happens, it happens. And when it happens, I will not be stupid enough to deprive her from fulfilling her basic needs just because of a number lawmakers made up. But if you want to talk about reality, my daughter is also affected by the same issues that most of teenagers now are affected by. She wastes a lot of time on entertainment and if you remember the example that we just said about the 20 years old man who is mentally still a kid, yes, unfortunately, like any other teenagers, my kids are also affected by that and they waste a lot of time on things that are preventing them from growing up mentally. That means that unfortunately they will not be ready for marriage soon and they will have to wait. Not because there is a magic number called 18, because they are not ready. Next question. How should I respond to a Christian Islamophobe? Uh, Christians attacking Islam, that is the funniest thing ever. They have no problem believing in Prophet David who raped a six years old who was already married and then killed her husband. They have no problem with this picture of the 90 years old man who married Mary and then holding the baby God in his hand. They have no problem that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. They have no problem with Lot sleeping with both of his daughters until he gets them pregnant. But then they attack you because they claim that the morality is is questionable. (sighs) They can't see how ridiculous they sound when they attack you. You know what? Just read for him Numbers 31. Moses was angry with the officers of the army. Have you allowed all the women to live? He asked them. No. Kill all the boys and kill all the women who have slept with a man. But save for yourselves every girl who have never slept with a man. Tell him you have no problem believing in a prophet who orders the killing of little boys along with their mothers and ordering the army to keep the virgins for themselves. 
Then he bullies you for believing in a prophet who got married according to the rules of God. Show him the church sexual abuse cases that are flooding the internet. And then invite him to Islam. Tell him he should become a Muslim so he would at least have something to be proud of in his life. The report cites a case where a sexually abused child came to a priest for counseling. His parents so trusting, they let him spend the night. The report says the priest raped him for five years. The investigation uncovered the extent of the power and authority the clergy used to exploit the trust of children. They told their victims the abuse was God's will. Some threatened that if the victim or the victim's family would go to hell if they told anyone. They attempted to normalize sexual behavior as roughhousing. Next question. How should I respond to an atheist Islamophobe? Well, dealing with an atheist on a moral issue is pretty easy, actually. You ask him one question. What is your reference for morality? He will have one of three answers. The first answer can be my source of morality is the collective agreement of society. Then you just tell him that marriage was okay according to the collective agreement of society of their time. And show him 20 or 30 references from the ones I provided in chapter 1. The second answer can be something like, my source of morality is what I think is correct based on my own moral compass. Then you tell him, okay, me too. You have right to have your own made up moral compass and I have the right to have my own moral compass too. You can't force your own opinion as a fact on others. He will shut up. The third answer can be something like, my source of morality is science or some evolutionary model of some kind. In this case, you tell him, perfect, I love evolution. The survival of the fittest or the survival of whatever is good enough, they are changing it over time. Anyway, whatever is good enough for survival is moral. And early marriages are actually superior to survival than late marriages. That means that he should be promoting early marriage because it's good for evolution. An atheist really will stand no chance trying to bully you. Before I go, I have a quick message to my brothers and sisters who are being pressured in their schools or their social groups. I understand you're going through a lot, but you need to understand that it's not your fault. And subjugating yourself to your bully will not make them respect you or even stop pressuring you. Think about it like that. Let's say you have a bully in your social group who keeps claiming that your own mother is a prostitute. Think about it. We all know it is not real, and we all know that your mother is a good woman, but he keeps saying every day that your mother is a prostitute. What will you do? Will you just agree with him to make him stop pressuring you? Or will you defend her honor until your last breath? Now those ignorant deviants are making claims about our prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, who is more important to you than your own father and mother. So why would you subjugate yourself to him? Do you fear them? Allah is more deserving of your fear if you are true believers. Those people are pretending to have moral standards. While all it takes for you to expose them is just to browse statistica.com for five minutes, you will be surprised. Those people are pretending to care about the freedom and prosperity of our women while they have no problem watching them getting bummed in their homes. Those people are pretending to care about the freedom and the prosperity of our children while they have no problem watching them getting bummed in their homes every day. Be proud to be a Muslim and don't be fooled by the morality bubble created by the media. The reality is and has always been the exact opposite. Today I am making a video trying to educate people on how marriages worked all over human history. After 100 years from today, Islamophobes will be saying, those Muslims believe in a prophet who thought that there are only two genders. And someone will have to make a video like me now to show them that 
all humanity believed in two genders all over history until the 21st or 22nd century. First, they change the reality, then they mock us for being normal. Be proud to be normal, be proud to be a Muslim. If you reached this far, first I want to thank you. Then I want to ask you a favor. As you can see, there are millions around the world in desperate need to hear this. If this video reaches them, it will definitely change their lives for the better. And the only way that can happen is by your help. Like and comment to boost the video's reach on YouTube. Then share it on your social accounts. You are also free to download it and upload it to your own channel. It is 100% copyright free. The Prophet peace and blessing be upon him said, deliver my message even if all you can deliver is one verse. And finally, don't forget to watch our video Nada Complains to Aisha. It is a summary of all the beautiful love story between the Prophet peace and blessing be upon him and our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. Link is in the description. And if you want to watch more than 200 reasons and evidences to believe in Allah and to believe in Islam, watch this playlist. It will change your life. Thanks and salamu alaikum. كلا بل تحبون العاجلة وتذرون الآخرة وجوه يومئذ ناظرة إلى ربها ناظرة ووجوه يومئذ باسرة تظن أن يفعل بها فاقرة كلا إذا بلغت التراقي وقيل من راق وظن أنه الفراق والتفت الساق بالساق إلى ربك يوم ساق كلا إذا بلغت التراقي وقيل من راق وظن أنه الفراق والتفت الساق بالساق إلى ربك يومئذ المساق فلا صدق ولا صلى ولكن كذب وتولى ثم ذهب إلى أهله يتمطى أولى لك فأولى ثم فأولى أيحسب الإنسان أن يترك سدى أيحسب الإنسان أن يترك سدى ألم يكن طفة من مني يمنى ثم كان علقة فخلق فسوى فجعل منه الزوجين الذكر والأنثى أليس ذلك بقادر أليس ذلك بقادر على أن يحيي الموتى Allah